you back on the right side of the boat. Some of y'all got thrown on the wrong side of the boat. Some of y'all got thrown out in the deep before you were ready. But God said, I'm finna fix all that. Wasn't no accident, sister. <laughs> Wasn't no accident, brother. God's about to mend you. If you can just allow him to bathe you in the anointing. If you can allow him to speak his wisdom out of the ministry gifts that he's placed in your life. If you can allow him to uh, impart to you the glory that is yours. You know, Adam and Eve fell from the glory of God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory. But Jesus has come to give you back the glory and honor that the devil stole from you. Some of you didn't have stuff stole from you. Had your honor stole from you. Had the glory stole from you. Had your money stole from you. Had your reputation stole from you. God said, I'm about to make you shine again. Right in the face of those who thought you were dull and dark and counted out. He said, I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to polish you up. I'm going to fix you up. I'm going to repair you. And I'm going to cause you to rise and shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen up on you. Now, I'm getting ready to let you go. I want to share if I could just give, you, give me two minutes to share this. The church has been preaching two gospels. Are you ready? The first gospel and the one we get stuck on is the gospel of salvation. For 20 years, the preacher trying to get your spirit full, your mind renewed, your body healed, and your life holy. Preaching the gospel of salvation for 20 years and we've been guilty but I'm going to just tell you like it is we've been guilty but how many of you know the gospel of salvation is entry level that's entry level that's entry level Jesus said I'm the door but if any man come in he goes out and in he goes out there's more to this than just the door of salvation you're not, you're not saved to say you're saved and go to heaven there's a second gospel that you're about to hear a lot of around here. God is a... You might well write this on your diary or whatever you want to write it on. Today's day, I am being transformed today. I begin my next... I begin my paradigm shift today. 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 My paradigm shift in the kingdom starts today. How many of you know you're saved? You know you're going to heaven. I don't care how you're living. You know you're going to heaven because the blood don't pay, the blood that paid for you. So why do we have to still rally around the gospel of salvation for 20 years? But there's another gospel. It's all part of the book. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached before the end comes. All nations are going to hear the gospel of the kingdom. Not the gospel of salvation. The gospel of the kingdom is what's holding up Jesus' return is the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And let me tell you what the gospel of salvation will do. Get people saved. Try to get them to live right. Get them to judge themselves. But the gospel of the kingdom will give you power. Y'all don't want to hear me up in here. Y'all don't want to hear me up. I say to give you power. Not to sit on that pew. You don't need no power to sit right there. It'll give you power to go out that door and move like you are net thrown by God in the sea of souls. Y'all better hear me up in here. The gospel of the kingdom. You can, I wouldn't miss a service around here right now. It's about to be some impartations. It's about to be some gifts released. It's about to be some assignments given. It's about to be some miracles happen. Not at this altar all the time. Under your hand. Y'all better hear me up in here. Under your hand. Listen, 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 listen. This gospel of the kingdom, I, I can't even get this out. This is just an introduction. This is just an introduction. Let me tell you what the Lord told me this morning. We're getting ready to shift with some folks sitting there. This next generation need to be up here closer to the front. The, 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 the kids, the, the, the kids, they, because see, some of us old dogs, we ain't going to get it. I'm just going to tell you, some of us just ain't going to want to change, ain't going to want to go. But see, Jesus say, if, 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 if you don't become as a little child, what will a child do? 
If a child see you casting out devils, somebody act like they got a devil, you know what that child going to do? Come out! Good God Almighty, y'all. Come out in Jesus' name. That child don't have no fear. That child going to do what he see being done. You can give any of these kids a mic up in here right now. They've been seeing us preaching. They don't know what to do. Praise the Lord. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Why? They see it. You got kids at your house right now. Say you got a headache. They're going to lay hands on you. Why? They're exposed to the gospel of the kingdom. They know God's a healer. God's, a, God's got power. But some of us, but not none of y'all, the people in church who rallying around the gospel of salvation for 20 years, they're just trying to stay saved. Things have shifted. I don't know if y'all... Things have shifted. This gospel of the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 4.20, and I'm closing. You know what we experienced this morning? You know what Jesus said? The Bible said Jesus went. He started his ministry saying this. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know what we did this morning? Before we even started the service, we repented and we said the kingdom of God is at hand. We received the kingdom of God. You saw the difference that happened in here this morning? We repent. See, we repented and we expected, we received, we entered into, we went after the kingdom of God. And when the kingdom of God comes on the scene, God's power, God's rule comes on the scene and devils and situations and circumstances have to bow to that name. Let me give you one more little bit of tidbit. Wherever you go, the kingdom going to go with you. We're going to show you. We're going to teach you how to carry it. My God, I, I, I was almost gone. We're going to teach you how to carry the kingdom. We, we ain't gonna, we, we're not, see, salvation, the gospel of salvation can teach you how to call the preacher. Y'all are, whoo. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. The gospel of salvation teach you how to call the preacher. The gospel of salvation will teach you how to pray, God do it. But the gospel of the kingdom, I've given you power and authority. You tread over serpents and scorpions, over all the power. Of the you cast out devils. You speak with new tongues. You lay hands on the sick and they recover. Not the preacher. Y'all, I, I don't want to get too deep in this. I won't take it too fast. I won't take it too fast. But if, if y'all can stick with us six months, you, you don't even know who, boy, you, you, ooh, you talk about Clark Kent. You be running in phone boots all over Baton Rouge, coming out, Supergirl, Superman. Some of you are going to be moving so deep and so hard and so strong, you don't even have time ch to put on your Clark Kent clothes. Going to be Superman, Superwoman at the job, Superman, Superwoman in the office. On a telephone, talking to your relative, the glory and power of God, going through the phone, healing them. All of a sudden, you're talking to them about Jesus, and you hear the phone drop. They're out. God giving them an overhaul, changing their lives right there over the phone. I'm telling you, shift has come to your life. I wish I could just download it all into you right now, but we can't because we don't want to choke you. But I'm trying to give you just a little taste of what God has for you. 1 Corinthians 4.20, I'm closing, you can get me some music. 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Well, that's all the time we have for today. You can order today's program in its entirety by calling the office at 225-274-3804. Pastor Virginia and I would like to invite you to our services. Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We are located at 12330 Florida Boulevard, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, next to All Star Nissan. Also visit our website at www.ffhm.net where you can get to know us better. Watch live and archive services and stay informed concerning upcoming events. If these programs have helped you, Help us help others by sowing an offering at the website. This is Pastor Thomas saying, allow God's word to transform you from a spectator into a participator.
Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Pritchard. station for smooth hits from the 80s, 90s, and today. 104.1 WDLT. Recently involved in an accident or fall and experiencing pain? We're open four days a week, some days 7.30 to 7.30. Call me at 476-PAIN. One call, that's all, to me, chiropractor Dr. James Gordon of the Alabama Injury and Pain Clinic. The choice is yours. Hi, welcome to another episode of Answers. This is Dr. Keith Clark. I want to continue my series on how not to waste money. Stay tuned. We've got answers. Hi, welcome to another episode of Answers. I'm Dr. Clark, and I want to get back to the subject matter. But before we do that, I want to just take time to thank all of you all who have reached out to me by way of Facebook, those of you all who have let me know, inboxing me, letting me know that, listen, you have been blessed by this show's answer, especially the one we did the last episode about finances. I want to continue that tonight, but I just wanted to take this time to tell you thank you so so very much you did not have to let me know that that message did that much uh, positive impact to your life and I want you to know I appreciate it how not to waste money that's what we're dealing with how not to waste money I believe without hesitation or reservation that it is God's desire that his people would manage their resources properly and as a result of that, have the financial security that they need to do all that he has called them to do. I believe that it's not God's desire for his people to be without. Now, I've got scripture to support that. One that comes to mind that I'm sure you're aware of. Psalms 23 that says, the Lord is my shepherd. Watch this. I shall not want. That means if God is my shepherd, I'm his sheep. There is nothing that I need I should be going without. Why is that oftentimes the case then, Dr. Clark? It is oftentimes the case because many who have been blessed with resources mismanage them. It is never God's desire for us to be without. Now, I know somebody is going to say, well, the Bible says the poor you would have what you always. It does say that, and that's a true principle. But the reality is he never said who the poor would be. So I suggest to you that you manage your resources properly. So those who are poor can benefit from your managing resources, which allows them to not go without because you have been put in a position to be a blessing to them. But you can't be a blessing to the poor, whoever they may be. And he never said who that would be. But you can be a blessing to the poor so that even in the poor state, their needs can still be met because the one, yourself, me, who has the resources are managing them properly. And if we're going to manage resources properly, then that means we cannot waste money. Last episode, we talked about the first practice to avoid. Now, whenever you're studying the scriptures, there are practices that you need to mimic, and then there are pr practices that you need to avoid. And one of the practices that you need to avoid, we talked about in maturity, but tonight I want to deal with the practice that needs to be avoided, impatience. Impatience. Whenever you are impatient, you will waste money. Whenever you are impatient, you will waste money. 
The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, that episode with the prodigal son, as Jesus tells that parable, he lets us know that as soon as the younger son gets his resources, when he gets his loot, the Bible says he goes into a far country. Not many days after, immediately, he gets the money and he gets to moving. That is a sign of him being impatient. And there are many of you all who are watching me now. You must admit that in your life, you've wasted money because of your impatience. I know I have. There's a whole lot of things that had I just waited, I would still have wealth. I would still have money if I had just waited. Impatient. He gets his money and he gets to moving. Now, let me share with you briefly the two things that causes us to be impatient when it comes down to finances. The two things, the two reasons why in most cases, if not all, we are impatient when it comes down to finances. And remember, impatience leads to waste. Immaturity will breed impatience, and impatience, like immaturity, will lead to waste. Watch this, impatient. The first reason why this young man was impatient, and it was obvious when you read the parable in its entirety, he was impatient, watch this, because he wanted what was eventually going to come to him, he wanted it now. Let me say it this way. What he would get later, he wanted now. The Bible says, thank you, Holy Spirit, he asked the Father for his inheritance. True, but the matter is, the inheritance belonged to him. It was his. And he would have gotten it at the father's death when the father died, transition. Then the younger son would have gotten his inheritance. But he could not wait till the father was dead. He wanted it now. You are being impatient with money. When what you know you can get later, you demand that you have it now. Wow. When what you know is coming to you later, you demand to have it now. And many times in life, many times in life, we waste money because we can't wait till later. We have got to have it now. My brother, my sister, this prodigal son waste money his resources, embarrasses the family, causes shame to come upon himself and his father's house because he was impatient. He could not wait till later. He had to have it now. And whenever you feel as though you have to have it now, and you can't wait till later, you are bound to waste money. Because impatience means you are being emotional. Impatience means you are buying off of impulse. People make millions of dollars every day on getting people to buy off of impulse. Getting people to buy without thinking. Getting people to buy right there on the spot. Go to a car lot. And the car dealer is, is, is almost uh, demanding, respectfully, that you get into the car and sit down. Why? Because he wants you to smell the new car smell. He wants you to feel the leather and he wants you to feel and look at all of those fancy lights and all of the mechanism on the dashboard. Because he's trying to get you to buy now. Doesn't want you to leave our door. And you can, the, the list can go on and on of places, businesses, marketing strategies that appeal to our impatience. This boy wastes his money because he's impatient. It's going to come to him later, but he wants to have it now. 
Who is listening to me? Where are you in your life financially? And there's something you're ready to do right now as I speak. And the truth of the matter is God has navigated the circumstances of your life and mine that we can make this connect at this time. And what you have to agree with as I'm speaking, that what you're about to do is nothing short of you being impatient with finances. How many married couples who wanted to get married and deserve to be married, but because they couldn't wait to get enough money set aside for them to live and the wedding, they chose to spend all the money on the wedding, and then now they're worried about how they're going to live. Impatience. Buying the new car. Buying the new outfit. Buying a new toy. Brothers, we do that like we buy toys, you know, uh, electric hammers and all that kind of stuff that we use for about a week and then we don't even want it anymore. Impatience will always lead to it. We can get it later, but we've got to have it now. One financial analyst told me something as I got serious about my finances. He said to me, he said, uh, Dr. Clark, if you really, 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 really want to buy something, and I mean it's just an overwhelming feeling that you've got to have it, give it 30 days. And at the end of 30 days, see if you feel about that item the same way. And if you do, then, you know, perhaps decide then if you should buy it. And I've done it, and I promise you, it has saved me more money than I can imagine. Just realizing that I don't have to have it right now. Impatient. When you know you can have it later, but you are demanding that you have to have it now. Now, I think I need to say this to you, because the enemy will try to make you think that you'll never get it later. So he'll deceive you into demanding it now because you won't think you can get it later. You don't know. You may not be alive. Come on with all of that. If you don't, if you, if you don't think you're going to be alive later, then why get it now? That's sure enough waste. Impatient. I can get it later, but I want it now. And you know I'm redundant, not because I think you're slow, but I want this thing to stick. Dr. Willie J. Newman, who taught his New Testament, said that constant review is the student's glue. In patience, <laughs> you can have it later, but you want it now. Here's the second thing. You're being impatient, watch this, when no sounds like not, well, I'm sorry, when no sounds like never. When no sounds like never. How many times we bought things? How many times have we wasted money because we really were consumed that if it does not happen now, it won't ever happen. If it won't happen right now, then it won't ever happen. And we get caught up in this rat race of competition, watch this, with unnecessary items and things that bring no value to our lives. Running around like a, a mice in a maze. Just going foolish because we are impatient. No does not mean never. No means no, but it doesn't mean never. When you study the scriptures, one of the things you will discover, and I think this is one of the, the awesome things about God. When you study the scriptures, you'll discover that God majored in doing things at the time when people thought it was too late. He majored. He majored in blessing people. He majored in performing miracles. When the majority of the people, if not all, were convinced that it would never turn around. He shows us 
that no today does not mean never. Lazarus is sick. Word gets to Jesus that Lazarus whom you love is sick. Jesus shows up. Lazarus is dead. And he's been dead for four days. The word and the atmosphere in the town when Jesus shows up is why are you coming now? It's too late. He's dead. He's been dead for four days. Sister said, by now he stinks. Jesus says, because he's dead. Because I didn't show up when you wanted me to. Because when you requested me to come, I said by my actions, no. You think it meant never. Show me where you laid it. You know the story. Right there in John chapter 11. Jesus walks to the tomb. He says, roll the stone away. And when they roll the stone away, he calls Lazarus forth. And Lazarus, come, Lazarus comes back to life. Because no does not mean never. And the Bible is salt and pepper. Calvary. And the redemptive work, hallelujah, that Jesus Christ did for us. Look as if God was saying no. And that no looked like it was really being interpreted never. What do you mean, Bishop Clark? The Jews were expecting him to come and overthrow the Roman government. They were expecting him to come and establish the kingdom right there in his time. And he said to them, no. That's not what I've come to do. I didn't come to establish my kingdom in the way you think. He dies and on the third day gets back up from the grave and 40 days later he ascends up to heaven and he tells them, he says, listen, go and witness to others. Bring them into the kingdom that is coming. Isn't that what we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Which means, watch this, that God will set up his kingdom. He said no then, but no does not mean never. And what God did in the sense of, of establishing his kingdom here on earth, now it's in the hearts of men. But he comes back to establish his kingdom on earth. And what he did with Lazarus, bringing Lazarus back from the grave, is what he desires to do with our finances. But we cannot be impatient. We cannot think that no means never. Just because I can't buy it this paycheck does not mean I can't get it next paycheck. Just because I can't buy Pookie the toy this Christmas does not mean I can't get it next Christmas. Just because it's not happening for me right now, the goodies and the creature comforts are not, I'm not able to afford them, afford them right now, does not mean I never will. Don't let the devil deceive you. Don't be caught up in this web of foolishness thinking that no means never. Don't be impatient. The prodigal son was impatient. He goes to a far country. He leaves the father's care. He leaves the father's uh, 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 supervision. He leaves the father's guidance. Because he is impatient. My brother, my sister. Take a moment. Stop. Oh, I'm serious about this. Stop. And ask yourself, is this something I have to have now? Or can I get this later? Am I of the mindset that no today means never? God's people have been too long without the resources we need. To live the life that we desire to live. To live the life he has no problem with us living. Using his resources that he's given us to be a blessing to the kingdom of God and expand his ministry. But yet we can't do that. Because we've been impatient. I encourage you. 
I, I beseech you, don't be impatient. Because when you are impatient like the prodigal son, you will find yourself wasting money. The Bible says he got his goods and he got out to the far country. Isn't it amazing that he had to leave the father's house to do whatever he wanted to do? In maturity, breathe in patience. And like in maturity, that leads to waste. In patience leads to waste. Watch this now. In maturity leads to waste because it is a mindset. In maturity is a mindset that manifests itself in actions. Listen to me good. When I'm immature, it's, it's a reflection on my thinking that is manifested in my behavior. But when I am impatient, it speeds up that process. In other words, immaturity starts me down the road to waste. But impatient is me running down that road. Immaturity, I'm on the road to wasting all of my resources. I'm walking, I'm immature, I'm wasting money, I'm walking. But when I become impatient, I start running then. And I get to waste quicker with my impatience. Don't be impatient. You can wait. You can wait. It's not going to kill you. Anything worth having is worth waiting for. Get your resources lined up. Get your credit together. Put everything. Listen, there's some things you have to pay. Bills and necessities of life. No, I'm not talking about that. But those other things, put pause on it. Wait. Wait to take the vacation. Wait. Wait to buy the new car. Wait to buy the new outfit. Wait. Wait on the wedding. I know I just made somebody mad then. Wait. Don't get impatient. If it's for you, it's going to happen. You don't have to get in the rush. I want to pray again. I want to pray again tonight because, you know, the overwhelming response I got from the last show, it, it just, I, I mean, I knew the Lord was telling me to share this with you, but I did not know, I couldn't fathom how many people needed to hear this thing about money. And I know it's a touchy subject, and you're used to preacher telling you, this is how you ought to give money, you have to get, and I'm not, you know, doubting that because it takes money to do things, but I can't teach you how to give money and not teach you how to save money. Because you can't give what you don't have. And you'll never have it if you waste it. And you'll waste it if you're impatient. Let's pray. Father, in your name, I thank you so much again. I thank you, dear God, for my brother, my sister, who's listening to me now. And I pray that what I have said from my heart has touched theirs. And that they, Father God, would begin to be patient, to wait. Before they spend, before they use their resources, that they would really ponder, if this is something that I can get later, why should I demand it right now? And then if you say no, tell them, let them see that does not mean never. In the name of Jesus, I pray for them as well as myself that we would avoid the practice of being impatient. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Answers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. You have a great day. You deserve it. Hi, this is Dr. Clark and welcome to Answers. Listen, before we get into the show tonight, there are many of you all who have called and uh, contacted us by way of Facebook email asking us, you know, how is church service, when does church service start. So for those of you all who are interested in meeting me in the sanctuary and not just watching me on TV, here's a clip from one of our Sunday morning experiences. I pray it blesses you. Seasons food. I don't care how the food tastes. Once you put salt, it changes. Salt never comes 
in contact with food and the food remains the same. So never comes in contact with food. I don't care how garbagely, garbagely it is. I don't care how uh, uh, cheesy it is. If you put salt in it, salt's going to be the dominating influence. Some of you all have been in restaurants with people before they eat tasty food. <laughs> Jesus says to his followers, he said, you'll salt the earth. What salt does the food you ought to do to people. So I came this morning, and for the next 15 minutes, it's 1210, I came this morning, and I just came to tell you, how you can be and stay so you're going to maintain your influence if you're going to convince people to do and do here positive sense you have to have the right attitude before people the right attitude the right attitude where you get that from from that passage well, when you study the context, Jesus has just finished teaching his disciples about the attitude, the beatitudes, or the attitudes to be. So he spends the first 12 verses teaching them of how they ought to behave and how they ought to present themselves. And then he says, you're the soul of the earth. Oh, man, I'm teaching it here. He says, if you're going to maintain influence with people, you have to have the right attitude and the right actions before Today, everybody get down there. Get down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna teach you today how spiritually you can shut it out. Stop shit. <laughs> spiritually, 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 spiritually. Now, once again, I said something that crossed your mind when you saw me with that salt. Watch this. That's it. Watch, watch this. I have to have the right attitude before people and the right action before people. In other words, when I am before people and I live among people, watch this. As a child of God, I have to let people see me respond, not react. I lose my influence when something happens in life and I don't respond, I react. tuned in to Life Television Network, bringing you nothing but the best in anointed teaching, preaching, and gospel music. This week on the Taking the Kingdom broadcast. Now, when is favor necessary? See, because some of y'all shouting and you don't even need favor. 
because favor is necessary for you know certain things now when is when is favor necessary favor is necessary when you have a vision that requires the finger of God to manifest it now let me ask you a question today do you have a vision in here when is favor necessary it's necessary when you have an assignment that exceeds your abilities when is favor necessary it is necessary when you face an enemy a problem that is beyond your stature some of y'all whining about the enemies in your life but sometimes you have a lot of the enemies because you have a lot of favor do enemies don't follow people who don't have favor on them if you have enemies it's a sign that you got favor Prepare your hearts to experience a life-changing anointing. Prophet Robert C. Blake Sr. pastors a ministry that reaches out to those who are bound and ministers healing and deliverance. His dynamic ministry touches the lives of people throughout the nation and international continents. God has placed a sure word of prophecy in his mouth. Welcome to the Taking the Kingdom broadcast. Let's join the prophet. Thank God. Amen. And then I have my doctor, Dr. Robert Charles Blakes, Jr. And all I need you to do is just pray a little bit, pray for him. I declare he's going to bless you this morning. Yeah, it's been a while since he's been here. And this morning, I want you to hear Dr. Blakes. You gonna bring it to the Amen. Good to be home this morning. I push take your seats. I, I, I made a point to get home today. I um I just left East New Orleans, did our seven o'clock service there and I say I got to go. I got to get get uptown. I want to um, I want to bring your attention to the Word of God um, say this with me favor, favor. touch that person next to you tell them I got favor on me Hmm. I'm just getting some things organized here. Touch that neighbor again and tell him, favor is on my life. Hmm. You know when you get when you get favor on you, uh anything is subject to happen. And uh, that's what I want to deal with today. <clears throat> I want to talk about living in the favor zone. You know, zone, when you start thinking about zones, um, a zone is a specific or particular region, a place, neighborhood, where something specific happens. Uh, it's a place where, where certain things go on and certain people reside. Um, even when you think about, you know, in New Orleans we love football. When you think about football, uh, there's such a thing as the red zone. And you love to see your team get down in the red zone because when they get in the red zone, it means that any moment the score can change. Yeah. one play you, you can be on the bottom this second and in one play one move you can be on top you know the last Super Bowl we had we we thought that uh, one team had it won but then the other team messed around and got down in the zone 
And in the last seconds of the game, they won the game because they had gotten into the zone. Well, there's a thing called the favor zone. And uh, the favor zone is, is a spiritual place where the child of God can step into and change his or her life forever. And that's what I come to tell you today. You, you may not realize that you may be looking at the circumstances surrounding you, but you, you are in the favor zone. Yeah, you're in the favor zone. I was sitting down with a young man, uh, when was it, Friday, Thursday in Houston. And he, I said, how are you doing? He said, Pastor, I'm having the best year of my life. He said, my business is up 26%. I said, you mean to tell me in economic times like this? He said, Pastor, I can't understand it. He says, but all I know one thing is I, I'm enjoying it. Now, how in the world you get your business up 26% in an economic climate like this, touching even to having the boy got favor on him? And in Psalm 102.13, he says, Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, type of the body of Christ, for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time is come. Touch your neighbor, tell them, my time has arrived. Now, now when you look at, when you look at, <laughs> y'all gonna make me jump off this stage? Yeah. I see why I was running up here. Hallelujah. When you look at the background of that text, the people of God were, you know, going through great struggles and the psalmist declares even in the midst of these struggles that the set time of favor had arrived. And uh, there are seasons in our lives when, when it looks like everything that can go wrong is going wrong. And, and it is in these seasons when things are their darkest that God stands up and God establishes a time in the life of a righteous man. To step into that individual's life and favor him in spite of circumstances or conditions. And see, this is why the word of God encourages us to hold on through difficult times. You know, I don't care how rough it gets. Stop all this whining and crying and complaining and buckle your faith shoes up and, you know, clamp yourself down and hold on because... Whenever you have a struggle, you got to understand God has a time for you to come out of it. And when you come out of it, you will always come out like Job came out with twice as much as you. What the devil thought he took for it from you, he's going to have to return with interest. I'm preaching to somebody up in here. Galatians 6 9 he says don't be weary and well doing for in due season you're going to reap if you faint not there's a set time so there's always a greater season of favor following every testing and every tribulation but you can miss it if you give up now, now what, is, what is what is favor in the old testament uh it, 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 you know, a few meanings. One of the meanings of the word as it's used in the Old Testament is graciousness or, or subjective kindness. Uh, in other words, favor is God's kindness bestowed on one simply because God chooses that individual over another. In other words, you know, it's God's prerogative. God can come up in here today and say, well, you know, I choose him, and I'm going to favor him. And he may say, well, why, why are you favoring him, and you're not favoring me? And God's response would be, it's my prerogative. I can do what I want to do. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Don't make me go back on you now. You know, it's when, it's when God gets... 
uh, he becomes biased regarding a, a particular child and God makes the game one-sided to the favor of that individual. Yeah, and look, look what the word says in Exodus 30 because we see it, we see it clearly here how the favor of God just, you know, God just says I choose to favor you and nobody can do nothing about it. In Exodus 3, 20 through 22, Listen to what God says to the children of Israel, to Moses. He says, and I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders which I would do in the midst thereof. And after that, Pharaoh will let you go. Watch 21. And I will give this people, these slaves, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, the slave masters. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. You're not going to leave out broke. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house, Jews of silver and Jews of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall spoil the Egyptians. You're going to take their wealth out with you. So the word used for favor here means a biased or preferred kindness. God made the slave masters favor the slaves to the point that they gave them their wealth. Now another meaning of the word favor, it means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. Favor is God, in other words, coming down and doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. Favor is divine intervention into human affairs. And sometimes men trying to explain, well, how did you, you know, they want you to write it on paper. Well, how did you do this? And what was the plan for that? And, you know, sometimes folks scratching their heads saying, well, I can't really give it to you because I don't know really how it happened. All I know is that, you know, I said I, I needed it. And, and next thing I know, I'm sitting in the middle of it. The reason you can't explain it is because God is the one that came down and what? Did it. Pull on that neighbor's hand and tell him I'm waiting on God to come and do some things. In Psalm 75, in Psalm 75, 4 through 7, he says, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. And to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Don't get beside yourself. Lift not, lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. Don't get arrogant and proud. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He put it down one and he sets up another. Now, now so the message of, of the text basically states, don't get beside yourself, don't get high-minded, because ultimately God's going to do what he wants to do. He will promote and set up those he prefers. And, and the, the term promotion here uh, means to, to be high. To rise or to raise, literally, it means to bring up, to heave up, uh, to, to lift up, to set up. And in other words, God takes and he, he lifts one, he throws one to where he desires him to be in life. See, when, when favor gets on your life, you got, to, you got to stay buckled in. It's like a roller coaster ride because in a sudden you can be jerked from the bottom to the top. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell them, stay buckled up now. Stay buckled up. Now, when is favor necessary? See, because some of y'all shouting and you don't even need favor. Because favor is necessary for, you know, certain things. Now, when is, when is favor necessary? Favor is necessary when you have a vision that requires the finger of God to manifest it. Now, let me ask you a question today. Do you have a vision in here? when it's favor necessary it's necessary when you have an assignment that exceeds your abilities when it's favor necessary it is necessary when you face an enemy a problem that is beyond your stature some of y'all whining about the enemies in your life but sometimes you have a lot of the enemies because you have a lot of favor due 
enemies don't follow people who don't have favor on them if you have enemies it's a sign that you got favor so so a person needs favor primarily for these three things now to bring a vision to pass, fulfill an assignment, overcome an enemy. In other words, a person that is not doing anything, not going anywhere, has no need for favor. Now, now the two necessary kinds of favor. We need favor with God, and we need favor with man. And what happens is that many people many times miss their, miss their full potential in life because they, watch this, disregard the favor of man. Some of you all in here today, you know, you have a poor attitude with people around your job. You're the worst neighbor in the neighborhood. Well, let me let me bring it where you can reach it. Some of y'all got the, the, the worst attitude in the whole congregation this morning. You don't speak to nobody but bishop and first lady. And then you're wondering why certain things don't show up in your life. It's because God has designed the system that whatever he's going to send to you, he's going to get it to you through somebody. But when people don't like you, it's hard for them to release into your life. The Bible says of Jesus in Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. God uses men to transfer the blessing to you. And when you have a personality that, that, that disrespects and ignores people, you often cancel the transaction, the transfer, the manifestation of God's blessing on your life. God can move somebody this morning to do exactly what you need done. But if you have an attitude that turns people off, you're often working against the favor of God. Now, how do we step into favor? Three things I want to share, then I'm sitting down. I got 25 minutes. I don't plan on using all of that. Number one, how do you step into favor, Pastor? Number one, favor starts where wisdom is sought. If you want to step into favor, a season of great favor, develop a mind to pursue wisdom in your life. God's favor is such a benefit that it cannot be trusted in the hands of a fool. The greater your wisdom the greater your capacity for favor. I was, I was talking to uh, one of my sons. He, he gifted, very gifted, extremely gifted. And uh, I said, I've been talking to him about, about the last six months. I said, when you, when you, are you going to school? When are you going to school? He just bouncing around, doing nothing, working all these little odd jobs, and young man, no family, no children, don't want to go to school. And so, you know, I asked him yesterday, I guess I said, now, are you, do you plan on, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do? You just go, you plan on just riding around, working all these little odd jobs, living like a little hobo, making a little few dollars here, a few, few dollars there. How are you going to increase yourself? I said, I'm asking you to go to school because when you go to school, son, it's going to expand your ability to learn and to grasp. And when God pours onto your life all that he wants to pour onto your life, it means that you will have a capacity to manage it. Yeah, you ain't got nothing going on to hinder you and you won't get, you don't want an education, but you know, some people just block-minded. 
But if you want, if you want favor on your life, you got to first get wisdom. Now watch this, watch this. Even though I mentioned school, you got to understand, wisdom doesn't come by way of the blackboard. That's just a form of earthly wisdom. It's a start though. The Bible says if you want wisdom, you ought to pray for it. And if you pray for it, God will liberally give it to you. Watch this story. Two young, two young ladies both went into business. One graduated from an esteemed institution. She had an MBA. Another young lady didn't graduate, but she had a few, few semesters of college, but she felt like the Lord was leading her into business. The young lady with the MBA, she put all of her books out and had all of her, you know, know-how and all of her intellect there on the table, and she was putting it together like they taught in the classroom. The other young lady said, well, I ain't learned all that, so I can't pull all that out, but one thing I can do is I can go around this community and I can talk to people who've been in business for years. And I can learn from their experiences. And so she went around, she talked to all the older, you know, seasoned business people. And they sat her in the office and they talked to her for hours upon hours upon hours. So finally they both decided to open the, their businesses. They launched around the same time. The one with the MBA, three years later she was still struggling and just about to break even. Three years later. The young lady who didn't have all of the education but went and sat down and learned from those who had done that and had been there. Six months after opening her business, she had to expand. Because her business was booming just that much. When you seek wisdom, shake your neighbor's hand and tell them favor will follow. You know when you look at, when you look at, when you look at King Solomon, God promised that he would favor Solomon like no other king because Solomon asked for wisdom first. And because he asked for wisdom, he stepped into the favor zone by recognizing wisdom in 2 Chronicles 1 and 10. Look what Solomon says. He says, give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people for who can judge this thy people that is so great. And look what God says to him in verse 12. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there any after thee have the like. God says, I'm going to give you what you asked for, and I'm going to give you more beside. It's because you asked for wisdom, now you got favor. Somebody wave that right hand and say, Lord, give me wisdom today. So favor starts with wisdom, where wisdom is sought. Secondly, favor comes with connection. Favor comes with connection. To step into the favor zone, you must identify rather your God-ordained relationships. Because frankly, some of you in here today are hindering the flow of favor on your lives because of who you're hung out or who you're connected to. Some of you all have the wrong people in your life. You cannot be tied down to curse people and think you're going to walk in the blessing. Oh Lord, hallelujah, help me preach this here this morning. That's the problem I have with young Christian women, you know. It's a strange thing how Christian women, your discernment works. As long as you know you're up in the house of God, your discernment works with the members in the church, your discernment works, your discernment work on the job, your discernment works with your family. But Lord, don't let a man that look halfway the way you want him to look and smell the way you want them to smell come up all your discernment goes blind this joker got two horns sticking out his head a tail hanging out his back coat and a pitchfork and you can't see this as a devil 
but his horns look so good, Reb. Hallelujah. <laughs> I know I'm preaching up in here. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell them you got to be connected to blessed people. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 20, he that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You are going to reap the fruit of the company you hang out with. And every wise person takes inventory of the state of his life, her life, after every connection you make. If your life goes in a downward direction after developing certain relationships, touch your neighbor, tell them that's a sign. You mean tell me after I connected with you, I can't pay my bills. I got all these past due notices. I'm stressed out. And that ain't happened to you showing up in my life. Care how much I might think I love you, you got to go. Robert C. Blake Senior Prayer Center. God's healing place for those who are ready to give up. Experience spirit-filled and anointed prayer partners as they minister biblical principles from God's Word. Call today. Prayer partners are available now. 504 569-8205 or log on to www.prophetblakes.com to submit your prayer request. Remember, your breakthrough is a phone call away. Become a covenant partner with Prophet Robert C. Blake Sr. Tap into the prophetic anointing upon his life by sowing a monthly seed of $25 or more. All faithful partners will receive a monthly special moments message prepared by Prophet Blake's. Also enjoy your personalized frame photo of the Prophet interceding for his faithful partners in ministry. Thank you for your sowing into the Prophet's life through your love and faithful support. The vision is unfolding as God uses Prophet Blake's to minister healing and deliverance to the nations. Today's broadcast is available on CD or DVD. Order your copy today. Remember to ask about the Prophet's new catalog or log on to ProphetBlakes.com. Thank you for your love and support to the ministry. Thank you for tuning in to the Taking the Kingdom broadcast. Robert C. Blake Senior Ministries is supported by faithful covenant partners around the world. Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Preacher. That all children deserve a bright future and the opportunity to pursue higher education. That's what my husband believed. His beliefs and his legacy have become the mission for the Robert C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Foundation. The R.C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Fund was founded in honor of my father, Bishop Robert C. Blake Sr., to provide opportunities for young people who have the desire to excel and the potential to succeed. As a family, we are encouraging every high school senior that's intending on going to college to visit rcblakesscholar.com to apply and to get more information. My husband loved and believed in you, and so do we. Welcome to Taking the Kingdom 
with Samuel and R.C. Blakes Jr. This is an outreach of the new home family of churches. Taking the Kingdom is the prophetic ministry of Bishop Robert Blake Sr. since 1964. Today, the mantle and mission has passed to his sons, R.C. Blakes Jr. and Samuel Blakes. Together, they are bringing the full gospel to a world dead in religion, teaching the word of God to the saints, raising up powerful churches, and demonstrating the power of the Spirit to a world in bondage. Put Satan on notice. We are taking the kingdom. Blessings and favor to you, my friends. What a blessing and privilege it is uh, to be able to come into so many living rooms, hospital rooms, bedrooms, uh, wherever you are, even to those who are behind prison bars. I got good news for you. You may be locked in, but the Holy Ghost is not locked out. God can reach you right where you are. Thank you for tuning in. You have tuned in on the right day for the right word. God has a word that is divinely orchestrated and designed to bring change to your life. I want you to sit back, fasten your seatbelts. We're going into the sanctuary of New Home Ministries, and uh, God's getting ready to bless you. Let's go in. God bless. We'll talk a bit there about the journey to freedom. We tend to know an awful lot about God blessing the Jews with the journey from slavery to freedom and less about our own. Every January 31st, December 31st, there should be a mass meeting of blacks to poor in New Orleans because literally thousands of us were dropped here into slavery in New Orleans. Some people said in a very trite way, they say, well, you know, we came in different boats, we're in the same boat now. That sounds kind of cute, but that's not reality. So we came on very different boats, very different circumstances. So immigrants came looking for a better place. America was their blessing. Refugees came in desperation for the war and America blessed them. Mothers came as contract. They worked for somebody, they brought them in, they worked X number of years, they get free. So we came as an enslaved people. No one ship was like our ship. Our ship was full of people being sold into slavery, not delivered into freedom. They had their Red Sea. We had our Atlantic Ocean. They had their port of Egypt, we had our port of New Orleans. Largest port in the world today is from Baton Rouge down to New Orleans, open port. They had their Jordan River, we had our Mississippi River, and our Savannah River. Say so God is older than Genesis and did not stop at Revelation. God is with us even now. The chief blessing for the biblical people was freedom. So not food, freedom. Not status, freedom. When God frees the people, that's the chief blessing. Bible says, and God said, we thank God for putting his mighty hand in delivering us from sleep. When I was a little boy, the big hero was Jack Robinson. Before that was the NBA, before that was the NFL, it was baseball. Jack Robinson came into white baseball. I say white baseball because it was, so there were three leagues, four leagues, so there were four leagues. African American leagues, called Negro leagues, white leagues, called major leagues, Latin American leagues, 
in Japanese leagues. They were white, black, Latino, and Japanese. So when we joined, so when we joined the white league, we didn't know how good baseball could be until everybody could play. We didn't come to the Dodgers to learn how to play baseball. We, we, we came starting. We had Jack Robinson, Don Luca, and Campanella, three black players. We figured we could win it, but we would lose to the Yankees every year. It's six games, one, or four games, or three or something. 1955, we thought we could beat the Yankees because we had Sandy Koufax and Drysdale. In the four game series, Yankees couldn't beat two of them. But on the day of the big game, this is the Super Bowl game. Kopax wouldn't pitch. So what's wrong with you? So that's that's your um, Kapur day. I can't play baseball on that day. That's the day the Lord delivered us. Said so no ball game, no thing, no money, no private joy is greater than I promised to God and I thanks to God for delivering us from slavery. Our deliverance tends to mean, see, our deliverance tends to mean ham, box, and greens on January 1st and a ball game. But God delivered, said that God delivering us from slavery is a big, that's the Super Bowl of freedom. How many of you knew your grandparents? Raise your hand. Knew your grandparents? Raise your hand. Your great grandparents raise your hand. Great great. Great great great. You kind of laugh because you don't. They are blur. In the first book of Matthew, David to Jesus fought said forty two generations. Jesus knew forty two generations. We stop at five. So Jesus quotes David, he's for the second degree, his lineage. Moses, 2,000 years older than David. So Jesus talked to Moses like he's his granddaddy, and Moses and Joseph was his dad. Now I want to follow me now. First slave is a kind of blur. See, if I do not know, what the Lord delivered me from, I don't know how to thank him. Say, so thanking God for a new car, a new suit, and a trip ain't quite like thanking God for freedom from slavery. Sixteen nineteen, we were brought here in shackles. Not for freedom, but for shackles. He was out on identity. And the worst thing they did was they erased our memory. They erased our memory. When I was a little younger, Grandma would be in there humming. And I didn't know why she was humming. She, she was not a songstress. She'd just be humming. She said, sounds a language devil can't understand. She'd just be, mm, no organ, no piano, no riffs, just be humming. I know she could think, though she'd act like she was a scholar. She, she could count like, she'd be making bread, count X amount of grains of salt, X amount of grains of sugar, a little flour. Like she was counting grains. 
She had to be a mathematician because it always come out just fine. <laughs> and that's why she would shout without, see, grandma could shout without organ. See, if I think, if I think about the goodness of God, I can thank God for his goodness. But if I can't think, I can't think. If I can't think, I can't shout. Many of us got PhDs in irrelevances and trivialities. She could think about how she had come out of slavery. See, if you can think, see, if you can think about God, really think, you really think. Let me put this another way. Someone turn the fan off, please. Can I help me? <laughs> now, this is not a shouting sermon, Melbourne. Because it seems to me that I believe in good gravy. Says so shouting is not gravy. Shouting is overflow. Shouting is not good gravy. But unless good gravy has a meat base, is just greasy water. Say gravy, gravy. must have a meat base, or it's just greasy water. So, so I'm trying to let a little meat base in. When the Constitution was written in 1776. We had been here 157 years already. So we were here before the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence was written in 1789. So we had been here 12 years before then. So we were here. We're not at the bottom of the nation. We're at the foundation. Now y'all have a different. See, the bottom is where you end up. Foundations where you start from. In other words, if you had a little condominium and you were on the 35th floor and a stiff wind blew the roof off, you would be upset because the roof was off. But folk on the other floors, they wouldn't be upset. But if there was a Katrina at the bottom, everything would be shook up. Say when the foundation shakes, everything shakes. We're not the bottom. We are the foundation. That's why we're the issue. The biggest discussion in 1789 was what should we do with them? What should we do with them who have driven our in this cotton to the top of the world? What should we do with them? So Africa provided three things. Take note, so Africa provided three things. The shipping industry for 250 years. It provided resources from Africa and cheap labor from Africans. So our four parents are not slaves. They're our ancestors. They're slaves to conqueror. My great 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 grandmama is not slave. I mean, she is my great great grandmama. Say, my great 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 grandmama is my great great grandmama. She's not my slave. So I should never again refer to her as slave. Go back with me a minute. The king was cotton. The South wanted to break off and form a whole new nation of cotton and us as labor and shipping clerks. So the shipping clerks founded Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and Columbia in Georgetown. That's what's coming out now and breaking out the news today, breaking news. And then they went a step further. So when we establish our, our, our preeminence as cultivating cotton, 
we became valuable. We're more valuable to our oppressors than to ourselves. See, if today, if today we've gone from picking cotton balls to picking footballs and basketballs and don't own our services, we just shipped and pick it. Thirty-two NFL football teams, right? We own none. Thirty-two basketball teams, we own none. Basketball teams, we own one. So picking cotton was not so bad. If we could own the seeds, get the government subsidy, and turn cotton in the textile, textile in the clothes, and ship them. We could only pick it. We couldn't develop. So picking footballs and basketball ain't bad. If we can't own it, nothing has changed but the product. <clears throat> Slavery. Illegal to learn to read or write. Slave master got caught raping one of our women. She was his comfort zone. She was his experiment. The husband, or the, the man, she cause couldn't have a husband, said marriages and family was illegal. So if he had sex with his daughter, or with his wife, he could do nothing about it. There was not one rape technically in slavery. To beat a man, it was his property. So if they beat the man, they could not protest his property. So you end up with one family with four children, two of them very dark and two of them very light skinned. Look, look around our complexions in this room. We do not look like Nigerians, like we're from Benin. We look like we're landing in New Orleans. <laughs> so our hair is different. Our skin color is different. So we are a people not based on color, but culture and relationships. So you say, it's all right, said a dark-skinned Negro, married, light-skinned lady, and vice versa, because we say we are a people, not based upon complexion, based upon culture. Jack and I have five children. All seven of us are different colors. And, and, and no one, it, it doesn't affect anybody. Say so nobody in the house is affected. Seven people in the same house, all different complexions. That's the lineage of slavery. You black men to have sex with black women. To make other little slaves. If they were sick, throw them away. If they were strong, put them to work, or sell them. You make a boy and they sell your son, you can do nothing about it. You had no, no right in court. So strong boys pick cotton or were sold to the, to the neighbor plantation. Remember Strom Thurmond some years ago, this lady, Miss Washington, went to South Carolina State? She was Sean Thurman's daughter. They finally put a name on the satchel in South Carolina a few years ago. Say, say, say young black girls were comfort zones and experiment for slave masters. So me too should have started a long time ago. See, in slavery, we could not get a wage. Illegal to get money for work. Had no health care. We got sick. We died. My grandmother, Brother Sam, grandma, didn't have, a, didn't have a birth certificate because she was the last of 13 children. She was sickly. She thought she wouldn't live. She didn't deserve to live. So she, 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 with them. she hopped along. Did she had my mom at 13. I'm discussing the race, say slavery, erased our memory. Now, just that's too far back. See, every, every cell 
one of our ancestors is downtown in the records in New Orleans. So I'm because on every ship, the, the government taxed the ship and the cargo. Every ship that landed, the product got taxed. You got taxed according to how many products were on your plantation. So if they knew how many of us left first Africa, how many got thrown in the ocean, how many landed in New Orleans, how many went to the sugar plantation, how many went to the cotton plantation. Talk to me, somebody. I want y'all to hit me. I, I know this ain't shout material. I just want y'all to bear with me for a minute. I'll allow let y'all let y'all go and watch the Pelicans or something after a while, but I got I got y'all trapped right now for a minute. So the records that we say we don't know our past, but those who conquered us, those who got free land from the government and tax subsidy from the government and paid taxes to the government, they know. That's, that's, a, that's a scripture that's kind of sad, 137 Psalm, saying we went by the rivers of say we went by the rivers of Babylon, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. Say so we're worse off. We don't remember Zion. We, we, we don't remember five generations deep. So that, there's there's no there's no there there. There's just a there's just, just a blur. There's just a, a dark spot back there. So some people call us, say our great 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 grandparents are not our slaves, but our them it will not be us. They are our ancestors, our parents, not our slaves. That leads into say everything fundamental to America is based upon slave trade. This is Black History, we're gonna sell it the same today. The South gonna break away. Lincoln said, "I tell you what, if, if, if you don't come back in a hundred days, I'll, 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 I'll take away your, I'll take away your slaves. I'll take away your economy." See, our people were the, the backbone of the Confederate Army because we were cooking while they were working, and we were crops while they were fighting. So Lincoln said, "I'll free them." It was the biggest single blow to the slave system. Let me say, in a hundred days, if you, don't, if you don't bring them back, I will uh, free them. Say, master to hell, if that's true. Say, first, we'll, we'll kill him. But you say, slaves are not going in. Say, we've had slavery 243 years. It ain't going in on no one moment. This, is, this was a fight going on. Our people have been waiting to hear a president with a full military authority give the order to free us. After all, we were enslaved by the government. So the government protected slave owners. We all better than this minute. Christmas meant nothing to our people because A, you couldn't shop, you had no money. No layaway, no credit card. So you couldn't leave the plantation. So, see, the big deal for us was December 31st. Lincoln said, tomorrow, right, if they've not reconciled, I will free you. The first watch night service was December 31st, 1862. Said so we watched. What, what good guys come to church and, and pray the next year and bad guys have a private party? Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I know that that word uh, has affected change in the lives of so many people watching today. That's our aim, that's our desire, not to impress you, but to improve you by the imparting of God's word. Listen, uh, if you're watching today and you're in need of prayer, I want you to sit down and call the number at the bottom of your screen there were counselors who were sitting, waiting to pray for you and waiting to pray with you and usher you into the things of God. 
Uh, there may be someone today who's unsaved. Maybe you're in need of salvation. I want to pray with you today. I want to pray that God will come into your heart and come into your life and that from this moment on, your life will not be the same. Will you pray with me? Close your eyes. Repeat after me. Father God, come into my heart. Take over my life. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my members to you. I ask you now, God, to forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me whole and holy. And I thank you now that from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. My brother, my sister, if you prayed that prayer with me, let me tell you, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. Now what you need is a good church to help affect change in your life. And let me tell you, one single service at New Home Ministries will change your life forever. I want to see you Sunday morning. I want to see you in Baton Rouge at 8 o'clock, 3000 Tecumseh Street. 1030, I want to see you in New Orleans at 1616 Robert C. Blake Sr. Drive. I promise you, if you come one time, you will come back again. I love you. Thank God for you. And until next time, if I don't see you here on the air, if Jesus comes back, I'll see you in the air. Bless your spirit. We believe that all children deserve a bright future and the opportunity to pursue higher education. That's what my husband believed. His beliefs and his legacy have become the mission for the Robert C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Foundation. The R.C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Fund was founded in honor of my father, Bishop Robert C. Blake Sr., to provide opportunities for young people who have the desire to excel and the potential to succeed. As a family, we are encouraging every high school senior that's intending on going to college to visit rcblakesscholar.com to apply and to get more information. My husband loved and believed in you, and so do we. You're tuned in to Life Television Network, your number one Christian station. Hello, friend. I am Dr. Henry W. Roberts II, and I am the president of the International Fellowship of Independent Christian Churches and Ministries and also businessmen. But if you're out there and you're looking for a place where you can learn and glean a fellowship, not somewhere where somebody's trying to lord over you or be your pastor, but you want to be in a, a part of something and your church is in an independent situation. And I know that there are a lot of us out there, but we're not independent, so to speak, but we're interdependent, and that's why we need fellowship. The Bible says where there's two, one can keep the other one warm. I want to come into unity and agreement with you, and I want you to consider becoming a part of the International Fellowship of Independent Interdenominational Churches and Ministries. Man, I'm telling you, we have such great meetings. We have breakfasts every quarter, and in those breakfasts, we share things that help take our ministries to the next level. There are also times when we bring in special speakers, but most of the time, we're just networking and coming together and sharing a group of pastors and ministers and leaders from the community that are coming together to create change in the earth realm. If you need a place, call home, a place that's going to love you, give you instructions and impartations that will cause your ministry to grow and change and be all that you believe God told you it could be, will become a part or consider becoming a part of the International Fellowship of Independent Christian Churches and Ministry. I'm so blessed to be the president and the founder of this organization. It was birthed because I started birthing sons and we needed to be, be, have a place that we could be around and just fellowship and glean from one another. The Bible says, iron sharpens is iron. So that the kindness of one friend to another. I may paraphrase that, but you know what I'm talking about. We need each other. Every joint supply. You may have a supply that I need. I may have a supply that you need. So an announcer is going to come and leave some information that you may know how to become a part of or find out when our next meeting is. I look forward to meeting you and greeting you in the name of Jesus Christ. On behalf of the International Fellowship of Independent Christian Churches and Ministries, God bless you and keep you is my prayer.
To learn more about the International Fellowship of Independent Interdenominational Christian Churches and Ministries or to receive a membership packet, write to 351 South Craft Highway, Chickasaw, Alabama 36611. Or you can call area code 251-456-2652. Airways Church of God, located here at 601 Clayton Street. I want to specifically and purposely invite you to come and to be a part of what God is doing here at Rice Temple. I'm your pastor here, Bishop Gregory S. Cannon. You can come and join us at 9.30 a.m. for Sunday school and at 11 o'clock a.m. for our morning worship. And each Sunday night, first, third, and fifth Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m., also, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. is our intercessory prayer hour, and at 7 o'clock is our Bible study. We want to invite you to come and bring your children, because at 7 o'clock each Wednesday, we also have what we call YPLJ, Young People Love and Joy Band, where our young people are taught the Word of God, and that we share with them in their own setting. So we want to invite you to come to be with us here at Rice Temple. You can reach us by telephone at 334-262-8452. God bless you. Come be with us. invite you to stay tuned for the next one hour for what God is going to do in this service. We thank God for you watching us here and we want you to tune in because God is doing marvelous things and we want to invite you to come to Rice Temple and enjoy a live service. Daniel chapter 3 and verses 12 through 18. If you'll stand to your feet when you get it. Daniel 3 and 12. We may read just a few minutes, but all right, everybody ought to be standing. And the word declared, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. Now, if you note, I'm jumping right into somewhat the middle of a text to go where I want to go. By the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then they brought them, these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready at what time 
ye hear the sound of the coronet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psalter, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the image which I have made. And well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is this God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And if you drop down to verse 28 and 29 and 30, and then we'll be through reading. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake, this is after the furnace, and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have sent his angels to deliver his servant that trust in him, and have changed the king's word, and yield their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which say anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sword. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Somebody say amen. amen. You might be seated. I want you to get me Roman 8 and 35 and hold it. And I'll be there somewhere down the line. I, I want to deal with this thought. I was uh, praying yesterday and afternoon and, and, and last night. I said, Lord, what in the world? do I need to say to the people? Because I, I never want preaching to be just another tuned up hollering sound. There needs to be some substance in order for you to grow in God. There needs to be something in the message that will help you to know whether you're on the right track or not. Now every message may not make you feel good. It may not tickle your ears. It may not give you your uh, destination point on this journey, but it'll at least let you know where you stand. And I want to deal with this message from this angle because I notice, and we have preached this so much, and everybody like to preach about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they went in the fire, but I, I saw something in these boys, the reason they were so committed to what they were doing. You know, you can be truly committed to the thing and truly wrong in a thing. Because you got some people that are committed to things, but they are deadly wrong in what they are committed to. You got some people got their mind wrapped up in certain ways of how they're going to do things, but they're just as sincerely wrong. So you can be sincerely right and wrong. But I noticed something in these three young men. These were young men that had been taken captive in Babylon because they had disobeyed the nation of Israel, had disobeyed God to the degree that now God is bringing chastisement upon them. And in their chastisement, uh, God did not put them in a chokehold and not allow them to be blessed. How many of y'all know some situation God gets you in, he will still bless you while you are in it? Because there's something God not going to get you out until he get ready to get you out. It, it don't matter how much crying, how much praying, and how much rolling you do when God get ready, he's going to get you out. But what I saw in these young men was a determination. They were determined that no matter what Nebuchadnezzar said, they would serve no other God. So I want to deal with the subject today, the reward of determination. 
because too many people are giving up and quitting now. They are saying, I'm tired of what I'm having to put up with, and I don't have to put up with all of that. But I, I thought that too, but I learned that there are some things that you have to put up with when you are determined to follow God. You, you know, a lot of things in life we commit ourselves to, even on your job, when you committed yourself that I'm going to stay here till I retire. I'm going to stay here and get all of my benefits. Y'all ain't going to work with me here. Hey, you can put it in your mind. Nobody's going to run me off my job. Nobody's going to treat me where I'm going to leave because I got a retirement. I got benefits. And that sounds like determination to me. You are determined that nothing will stop you. Well, I wonder why is it then that when it comes to the church that we are so easily moved out of God. There are times when God sent us through a certain situation that we lose our determination because of the pressure and the, the pain that we have to deal with. But I don't know whether you understand it or not, but this way is full of pressure and pain. If you live right, you're going to go through some stuff. Amen. I believe with the Bible that declared that any man that will live godly, he shall suffer persecution. There's no way around it. The only way to get out of it is to go through it. See, something we telling God, oh, God, I want out. I don't want to have to deal with this. I told him that too. But God knew that the thing that I'm trying to get out is the thing that's going to develop me and make me what I ought to be. See, see, some stuff you dealing with, it's not because God just want to see you cry or he want to see you hurt. He's trying to take stuff out of you. I understand that many things that God has put us into is more for your good than for your demise. He's trying to build you. He's trying to make you. He's trying to purge your life. Some things we got in us, God needs to get out of us. Hello, somebody. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, instead of us reading Psalm 23 all the time, maybe you ought to go to Psalm 51 and be like David. David said in Psalm 51, after he had messed up against uh, Uriah and Bathsheba, he began to cry to God and said, Lord, have mercy upon me according to thy loving kindness and thy tender mercy. And he said, blot out my transgression." Why is that necessary, Bishop? Because I read one place in the scripture where the Lord said in that day, he said, many are going to cry and said, we prophesied in your name and we cast out devils in your name. But Jesus said, you did it all, but I never knew you. Why you don't didn't know us, Lord? He said, because what you did, your work was in iniquity. So rather than reading Psalm 23, trying to encourage yourself that the Lord is my shepherd, you ought to be saying, Lord, look on my life, and if there's anything in here that's not like you, I need you to get that out of me. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, to me, had been through that process. And the reason I say they'd been through it because they had reached a point of determination. See, when you go through enough stuff, you get determined that nothing else is going to stop me. I even had a lady tell me one time she had dealt with men that used to jump on and beat her. She said, I'm determined the next man hit me, he's going to have to die. I said, well, sir. And she had a determination she wasn't going to be beat no more. See, when you get tired of being beaten up by the devil, there ought to be a determination. We not fight no more, devil. I believe even the scripture said that the kingdom suffer violence and the violence taking it by force. When you get tired of the devil punching on you and knocking on you and lying to you and selling you with tickets, you ought to get to a place and be determined that I will buy no more. See... We're living in a time where people are so easy to quit now. Giving up on life. Suicide rate is higher than it ever been. People are special among young people. Why? Because they have no determination. Even when they're young, they don't even know what life is. But somehow, the enemy have planted a seed that checking out is better than going through. I got news for you. Suicide 
is a permanent answer to a temporary situation. Because once you're dead, you can't come back and refix the thing. Once you kill yourself, you're out of here. No more remedy for your problem. But if you hang out a little while, God will bring you through. I read over there when David said, weeping may endure for a night, but he said, joy comes in the morning. If you learn how to hang out with God for a little while, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with. He'll bring you out of the thing. The testimony of these three young men that was taken and captive in Babylon, uh, they were not dog catchers and street sweepers. They were not put in position uh, to clean up this highway, but God blessed them to rise to places among those that was in authority. King Nebuchadnezzar found grace in their eyes and he placed them in the hierarchy of his uh, government. See, sometimes when you're going through, God puts you there because he's trying to promote you. Some of y'all trying to promote yourself. Self-promotion will never last. You got to go through some stuff. And then going through, you got to be determined. It's not about the promotion that's at the end of this, but it's about me going through. It's about me not dying where I am. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they realized they were in a terrible position, but they understood who they were worshiping. They realized that we are serving the only God, the God that declared in here to Israel in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. He said, here, O Israel. Israel, the Lord our God is one. They said, we are serving the one God. And we refuse to serve another God. See what's going on in our society and in the world today. We are choosing to worship and serve other gods because your God didn't move fast enough. And I got news for you. God don't move on your time. He moves when he gets ready. Because if God moved every time that we said move God, some of us would really be in a mess. Oh, yes, if he would move every time you said, God, I need you to do something, you probably wouldn't have been as strong as you are now. Something taught you how to be strong. Something taught you perseverance. It taught you how to wait on God. When God sent you through a dilemma, he's teaching you patience. He's teaching you endurance. He's teaching you how to hold on when nobody else is encouraging you. See, you, you know, when you have determination, uh, it brings on some things in your life. First of all, to be determined means to be firm in your purpose. You got to know your purpose. You got to understand, why am I doing what am I doing? Why am I here? Why did God leave me here? Some of you are 60, 70, and even in your 80, you ought to ask yourself, why am I here? I got news for you. There's a reason why you're here. God didn't leave you here just to occupy space and time, but you got something. You got a treasure that's been hidden down in your life. He said, I call the young because they're strong, the old because they know the way. There are some of you that know the way, but you refuse to tell it because you said this generation don't want to hear what I got to say. Tell it anyhow. Sometimes, as a preacher, I know folk don't want to hear everything we got to say because everything God sent out is not always good. Come on, talk with me. When I say good, it's not always what you want to hear. Sometimes when God sent the prophet in the Old Testament, they didn't want to see the prophet because they were unaware of what he had to say. Many times when the prophet entered the city, first thing they would ask the prophet is not what you got from me, what word the Lord gave you. See, old prophets are not like the modern day prophet. Because the modern day prophet, every time you run up to them, they got a word for you. You're going to get a house, you're going to get a car, you're going to get that man. God's going to give you that wife you want. Hello, somebody. But in the Old Testament, when the prophet showed up, they asked the prophet, is all well. In other words, is God all right with us? Are we, have we upset at God? See, they were understanding that when God sent the prophet, he sent him because he had a word. Not because he was trying to buff their ego or prop them up or pump them up. God had a word. Sometimes when God sends a man of God, the woman of God, it's not because he's trying to make you feel good, pump you up, lift you up. Sometimes he's got to dig deep and uproot you a little bit. 
told the prophet Isaiah, cry loud, spare not, <laughs> lift up your voice like a trumpet. What am I going to say, Lord? He said, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Oh, no, no, Isaiah didn't have a wonderful message. He didn't have a message of, glo of, of glory and hallelujah and lifting your hand and praising God. He had a message that was sending them home, looking at themselves and crying and begging God, what is it that I need to do, Lord? Hallelujah. But when I look at my text, and let me go to that. I'm almost done if y'all don't know it. When you understand your purpose. You ought to get determined, fixed in your mind, that nobody's going to stop me. Because I got news for you. If you're going to run for Jesus, you need a determination. You need a, a, a root down inside of you that will lock you in place, that will feed you in drought and time of starvation. Because, you know, when people, you're not doing what they want you to do, they have the tendency to want to starve you out. One preacher told me, he said folk told him he was sent to pastor a church. And the preacher, the folks that had been before him, either were jelly back or didn't have no determination. Because so they told him, say, we've been known to stop preachers. In other words, we've been known to control them. If we don't preach what we want, we'll, you know, put a stop to that mess he's talking about. But see, what you got to be determined here, you got to be determined I will cry whether they like it or not. And he said the first Sunday he pastored that church and they told him what they, we known to break preacher. He was so determined they wasn't going to break him, he turned 25 out on one Sunday. <laughs> and all of them were just kinfolk. <laughs> See, <laughs> some of y'all don't realize when you get determined, you got to put some folk out your life. You got to put some folk out of your path that's walking with you. I know that's your homeboy. I know, you know, he's your home slicer. You know, you know what y'all call him now. I don't know what they call him now, but you know, your skillet, okay. Uh-huh, he's your home skillet. But I got news for you. Them young people will help me with service over there. Tell me, Bishop, we don't talk like that no more. But I don't care what he is to you when you get a determination that you want your life to be right before God. There are some people that got to exit your life in order for God to make an entrance. There are some things in your way right now. The reason you haven't reached the plateau of your blessing and your favor with God because there are some things and people that need to get out of the way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, the king had done everything in his power to kill their determination, but they were determined to serve God anyhow. What did he do to them, Bishop Cannon? First of all, he brought them in a strange land. And when they came into the land of Babylon, he took away their worship. He tried to change their God. He even made them eunuchs, meaning that he had taken away their manhood and made them in a position that they were not even desirous of another person. But they were determined to worship God. See, sometimes in serving God, there are people that try to take stuff away from you. They try to kill your mentality. They try to work on your mind and get you all broke down in your mind. That's why some people tell you, don't nobody want you but me. The devil lives a lie there, tell you. You done got to be a 16. I remember when you were nothing but a 6, but now you are 16. I got news for you. Don't worry. Somebody loved them 16. But see, you know, it's all about men. They'll tell you how you used to be a six, and now you are 16. But he don't talk about when he used to be a 32, and now he's a 48. You got to be determined. You can't mess with my psyche. You can't mess with my mind. You can say what you want to say, but I'm determined that I'm going through anyhow. Who glory. Uh, 
Oh, Lord, have mercy. Y'all pray for me. I'm going to take my time. Huh? Sometimes there are demonic forces that are assigned to your life to tear you down. He'll tell you how many times you've been married and divorced and how many times you've been, you know, put out and how many times folk didn't like you, how many folk done quit you and left you alone and how many times you've been up in the house by yourself. But you got to tell yourself in your own mind that I'm determined I'm going to make it in the house. If I have to make it by myself, you don't need all them folk. Sometimes you dragging along folk that's going to kill your destiny. You dragging folk along that's going to bless, mess up your blessing. There are some people designed to mess you up. They're just like old leech. they blood suckers. <laughs> Help me somebody. Some of y'all got some blood suckers in your life. You need to get rid of them, pull them off, set them on fire, burn them, throw them in the garbage, do whatever you got to do to them, but get rid of that blood sucker. They sucking the life out of you. Every time you look like you're going up, they pull you back down. Every time you feel like you're going to make it, they go to messing with your mind and you start to feel the press and down and out. Honey, you don't need that man. You don't need that woman. You don't need that individual in your life because God got a destiny for you. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace. Come on, somebody. He said, I got thoughts that I'm going to bring you to an expected end. See, God, mind for your life is not what your buddy mind for your life. Because, you know, there are some people tell you, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you to the end where they, where they are now. They gone. Them same folk that told you, I love you forever. You the apple of my eye. You the sweetness in my coffee. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me, somebody. Your coffee dog ain't got no sugar. Not even sweet and low. Because they gone. They left you. They abandoned you. But the Lord is always on your side. That's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were determined because when everybody else fell there, when everybody else left there, it was the Lord that was on their side. Oh, God. I feel like preaching in here. It was the Lord. See, that's why I don't get what nobody said. I'm not going to abandon God. Come on here. Y'all talking about you run too much, you go too much, but you got to understand it's the Lord that keeps me up. Broadcast, we really hope that you were blessed today by the word of God. We want you to come and join us in a live service. I hope if this service today has been a blessing to you and to yours that you will write us and let us know that you were blessed by the word of God, that you were blessed by the anointing that was falling in the worship service. And you also can obtain a copy of this service of today by writing us at 601 Clayton Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. If you'd like to receive a copy of this service today, you can have it on CD or DVD. Just write us here at Rice Temple at 601 Clayton Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. And include a donation to help us to continue this broadcast. God has been blessing souls in our service. Come be in a live service and experience the powerful move of God that's on this ministry. I believe that God is moving for such a time as this. We realize that there are crises all over the land. But come and share in here at Rice Temple, AOH Church of God with us. I'm your pastor here, Bishop Gregory S. Cannon. God bless you. Until next week this time, you be blessed of the Lord. And remember... There is a word from the Lord.
Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Pritchard. We would love to have you come fellowship with us at Word of Life Community Church located at 111 South Florida Street in East Bruton, Alabama. Our service times are Sundays at 10 o'clock a.m. for Sunday school, followed by an 11 o'clock worship service, and on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. for our Power Hour Bible study. For more information, log on to our website or call 251-456-2652 or 251-809-2887. Welcome to Fresh Manor Media Broadcast with Pastors Harry and Virginia Thomas and the Fresh from Heaven Ministries family. Fresh from Heaven is located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Many people in the natural were missing God because they never cultivated and developed their faith. Because when you review the scriptures, everybody that ever received from Jesus when he was in the earth realm, he would have a response. Be it unto you according to your faith. Go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. So it's essential as a believer that I get around some good teaching. Because faith comes how? In hearing by what? So as I hear this word today, I should be obtaining faith for what I hear. Welcome to Power in the Word, the exciting teaching ministry of yours truly, Dr. Henry W. Roberts II. I am the founder and pastor of the Word of Life Community Church, one church, multiple locations to serve you and your entire family. Right now, I want you to call a neighbor, call a friend, let them know that Power in the Word is on the air. And after this, I'm going to come back and let you know how you may obtain a copy of today's message. So until I should see you again on this air, God bless you and keep you. Get ready to be blessed. You got it? Well, I tell you to go. Psalm 6, 8, verse 17. All right, ready? Everybody read. This is what your Bible says. You brought it in here. I wasn't passing them out at the door. All right, ready? Read. 19. Go on down to 19. Skip all that for the second time. Run down to 19. Then what does God do every day? Wow. Come on back to Psalm 103, because I'm, I'm trying to show you. God don't want you suffering. God don't want you broke. God wants you to be able to pay the e bill. Amen. 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 You got my scripture? We're back at 103. Let's go to verse 2 this time. Ready to read? Keep reading. So number one thing God benefit me with, he forgives me for everything I ever did wrong and everything I might do wrong in the future. He said, who forgives, what he say? Son. All. all of my nigga. Keep reading. No, some of them. So how can the Bible say God heals all my diseases and then you listen to some preacher or somebody who's been in church talking about God put the disease on you to teach you something. He just lied on God. Now, just because it ain't happening in my life don't mean God ain't still doing it. See, many people, yeah, I'm going to say it just like that, Holy Ghost. Many people in the natural were missing God because they never cultivated and developed their faith. Because when you review the scriptures, everybody that ever received from Jesus when he was in the earth realm, he would have a response. Be it unto you according to your faith. Go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. So it's essential as a believer that I get around some good teaching. Because faith comes how? In hearing by what? 
So as I hear this word today, I should be obtaining faith for what I hear. First of all, the, the Bible mentions money, the word money, M-O-N-E-Y, over 123 times. So they let you know money ain't something God's scared to talk about. We might not want to talk about it, but God has no problem discussing money. See, somebody still stuck back there when I told you the kingdom of heaven was where God lived, and the kingdom of God was how God does what he does. Mark chapter 4, real quick. Man, I'm almost out of time. I think I want like the 26th verse. Then we're going to have to go to Revelations. I think it's around the 20th or the 21st chapter. Y'all got me? Mark 4, 26. Talking about the kingdom of God right now. God's kingdom. That's God's. Say that. Say the kingdom of God is God's way of doing things. Y'all let it? Amen. 26. All right, ready to read verse 26. Ready to read. He said, so is the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. So is the kingdom of God. Read. As if a man should cast seed. As if a man should cast seed. He said the kingdom of God operate as if a man should cast seed. Keep reading. Yes. For fruit, keep reading. Uh huh. I call that the law of progression. You can't do nothing before it's time. Notice it's a first, then, and an after. That's the kingdom of God. Real quick, you just mark it for your notes because I'm running out of time. I need you to go to Revelation now. Show you the kingdom of heaven. Show you the kingdom of heaven. There's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is where God lives. The kingdom of God is how he operates. See, that's good, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost just trying to talk about Moses. Moses in Israel. The Bible said Moses knew God's ways. But Israel knew his acts. Moses knew God's ways, acts, ways, but Israel knew his acts. In other words, bring it in to you. Moses knew how to get God to move. Israel only seen the manifestations of Moses' prayer life. They saw the acts of God. Red sea pardon, flies, blood, frogs, huh? Death angel. Those were the acts, but it was something went on that caused the acts. Moses understood the ways of God. Tell you who else understood? Oh, David. Bible said David was a man after God's own heart. David go out there and do something real scandalous and know how to get right back in God's face, get that blood applied to his life, get that forgiveness, get right on back in that way he's supposed to be. Even when they wanted to kill David, God said, you better not touch him. He is the apple of my eye. Where I tell you to go? Revelation 21.10. Let's go there. Come on. We'll show you heaven. Just a couple of verses. You got your own Bible. Write it down. You go back and study it later on. All right. Ready? Read. Listen. Descending what? Descending from where? Descending from where? Keep reading. Keep reading. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Keep reading. All the cities of the kingdom of heaven shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Keep reading. Verse 
city had twelve foundations, and in the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Keep reading. Jesus. Yes. Huh. That just shows you how balanced God is. See what I'm saying? The length, the breadth, the height, everything is equal. Four sides, God is a balanced God. Amen. Two is the number of covenant and establishment, but four means security, balance. It's just as tall as it is wide. Just as deep as it is high. Keep reading. And even after the wall of 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 the from their celestial form. So when he say according to the, uh, the measure, man, man, an angel is huge. It's, it's, it's two of them go with me everywhere I go. I got one for prosperity and one for protection. Yeah, you, you got some too. I just call mine out. You can't see them, but they walk. When I walk, they walk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, if you, I'm going to give you a quick reference. Remember uh, uh, when, when they were walking around the city? Walk around the wall. And then remember man drew his sword and he looked up and he saw the angel. And he, no, look, he looked up at the angel. The angel had the whole road blocked. That's how big they are. So in compared to a man, and I'm a pretty tall man, I ain't taller than some men, but I'm about six two and a half. He, he used to be six three, I'm shrinking because I'm getting older. But watch. He, he, he's way up out of this room. So he wants us to get a visualization on how huge our protection is. Top flight security data. All right, come on, read. Come on, read. I'm running out of time. My God. Jasper, all these precious stones. Now, see, that's why I got to get you to get rid of a broke mentality because you can't go with no broke mentality. Say it with me. Heaven is a very rich place. One more time. Heaven is a very rich place. See, you don't be around people that ain't used to nothing. Y'all have them come to the family reunion. Everybody, we got enough food here for you to eat. 